thank you. Thank you all for being here. Um, and thanks to the Friends of the Library. Everybody should support the Friends of the Library um, because all Friends of the Library groups are wonderful organizations. So wherever you live, support your Friends group. Um, you may have wondered why I was introduced, but not either of these two lovely ladies on the, on the side. That's because I'm going to be the moderator of sorts of the, our little panel tonight. And I would like to welcome you all and thank you for coming. I'm going to let um, Joanne on this side and Kate on this side uh, briefly introduce themselves. Um, and I will begin with Joanne. I'm Joanne Smith Ainsworth. I'm the author of six published novels. The first four are historical romances. The last two are paranormal suspense set in World War II, where the US government recruits psychics to find Nazi spies. I'm happy to say that Expect Trouble, book one of this group, is a, now an audio book, and it also won the runner-up position in Shelf and Bound, and the semi-finalist position for first chapter award from East Texas Writers Guild. And Expect Deception over there, also won from East Texas, but it got finalist position, and it got a finalist position also in the 2016 Best Book Award in the category of Mystery and Suspense. And Kate? My name's Kate Raphael, and I am a legal word processor by day and a um, novelist, activist, journalist, and radio producer by night and weekends. Um, I've written two novels now, two published novels, working on the third. It's a series set in Palestine. I proudly claim with no, having done no research on the subject, but being absolutely confident that I'm correct, that it's the first English language mystery series with a Palestinian policewoman as protagonist. I've been saying that now for three or four years and nobody's ever contradicted me, so <laughs> I think you can, you can put it in the bank. Um, these are based on my experiences as a volunteer in Palestine. I lived there off and on for about two years. And when I came back, I had a thousand pages of journals and I thought, well, probably nobody would want to read a memoir, but maybe I could do something different with my writings. And um, the first Murder Under the Bridge was the first. It won a couple of awards as well as Joanne's did. And Murder Under the Fig Tree is the second in the series and just came out in September. Okay. All right, I'm, go I'm going to, uh, since we're introducing our books as well as ourselves, I'm just going to say a, a word or two about mine. Um, it was mentioned that Snow Angel just came out. It features, um, my sleuth is a, a private eye and she works as a detective to support her art habit. She has two professions that are equally important in her life. Um, she's an artist and she's an investigator. And she becomes involved in, she's based in San Francisco, she becomes involved in this particular case when a little girl disappears the night before her father is set to testify in a high profile murder case. And she has been teaching art lessons to this little girl and becomes involved in a search that takes place in San Francisco's wintertime, and it's raining, so it's not this winter. More <laughs> like last winter. But uh, it takes her from San Francisco to the snowbound Sierra and deep into the hearts of two shattered families. This one's a bit different. Um, it takes place in Marin County. Um, it is a ghost story. And my sleuth in that one is an amateur sleuth. She's a real estate agent who discovers that she has the ability to sense things when she goes into certain houses that nobody else experiences. And uh, that leads her, in this case, to solving the mystery of 
what happened when she's given a house that uh, as a listing that nobody else will touch because of murders that had occurred there. Um, and a second volume in this series is going to be coming out along about the end of the year. So, <laughs> I welcome applause, thank you all. Okay, so what led you to mystery, Joanne? You started with, with uh, writing in a different genre, mm -hmm. and you've come to, you define your books as paranormal suspense, um, my sense of the mystery category is that it's very broad and if there's a crime in it that is central to what's going on and people are trying to figure out what happened, that makes it a mystery. Um, not everybody quite agrees with that. If you look on the shelves, you'll see the thriller category and the suspense category and the cozy category and the hard-boiled categories, but it's all mystery to, it's all a mystery to me. So much is a mystery to me. Um, what drew you to mystery? I started out writing romance, but I always had a touch of something that was suspenseful in it. And I found after four books that a mystery was not for me because I wasn't good at putting clues in. And my critique partners would keep telling me, you're giving it away, Joanne. Don't do that, put it in later. So I decided I would write suspense and what I do is I put you all into the heads of my characters, my main characters, and I also have my villain be one of the main characters. So you have that point of view. And since I write in what's called a deep point of view, you get not only a third person that I'm writing in, but you're getting the emotions of that particular point of view character. So it's almost like writing in first as well as third. And that's how I do my suspense and build up my suspense. You all know what's going on all the way through, but the characters themselves don't. When I put this in, in a romance, it was that the woman farmer taking her wagon of goods into the town, the reader knew that along one road to the left were the outlaws and the other one was clear all into town and of course she'd go left. So I do that same kind of thing now. I write historical because I'm older. I started writing as, a, as I came into retirement and I haven't a clue what's going on now, especially the technology. So I couldn't write a contemporary <laughs> like they do. I take historical where it's already done and I can deal with it. Okay, so Kate, um, you came home with these thousand pages of journaling about your experience in Palestine. Why did you decide that a mystery or a mystery series was the right way to distill that experience down for yourself and for the readers? Well, I should say, first of all, that I didn't know I was writing a series when I started. I just, I had, shortly before I left Palestine for the last time, I was deported in um, 2005, meaning I can't really go back there, um, deported by the Israelis, but arrested in Palestine. Shortly before that happened, I was traveling late at night with some friends, and I saw a scene where there seemed to be an abandoned car up on a, an overpass on an Israeli road that passes over a Palestinian road. And I just thought, oh, this would be a great way for a mystery to start. And I mentioned that to a friend of mine and who was with me. And then the next day she was out olive picking with some other volunteers and she mentioned it to them and they had all these ideas. Oh, and the body could be there and this person could be coming by and not see it. And so I thought people seemed to be excited about this idea. I mean, I love mysteries and I have been reading them since my mid twenties, I guess. And you know, I love the figuring it out aspect. Mm -hmm. I don't love the figuring out how to 
help people figure it out. Like, <laughs> like the figuring out how to write it part, I don't love so much, but I love it when it works. And, you know, so I just felt that it's, it would be a fun way, it would hopefully be fun for me, and it would hopefully be fun for people reading it and maybe reach an audience that wouldn't mm -hmm. be necessarily drawn to a nonfiction book about Palestine. Um, because there's so many people who love mysteries and especially international mysteries. Mm -hmm. Well, I think sometimes fiction is a better way to get at the truth than nonfiction. You can get a lot of facts into nonfiction, but fiction gives you the opportunity to provide people, readers, with the experience of the place and of what the people are going through um, and give them insights in a whole different way. Um, so, Joanne denies writing mysteries. It's suspense. But it's all under this crime fiction umbrella. And uh, the, we have Mystery Writers of America here in, in the States, um, which is the professional organization for mystery writers, but they define it very broadly as well. And put almost all kinds of crime fiction under that umbrella. Um, the Brits, who always seem to have a way of solving all of these problems, just call theirs the Crime Writers Association. And that takes in everybody. But one of the th things that is true is, I mentioned earlier, the cozies at one hand and, and the hard-boiled at the other. And while that often applies to detective stories, it's kind of a way, a shorthand of describing what kind of mood you've got, um, whether it's lighter or darker, whether it's less violent or more violent. Um, and I don't think of these as different types. I personally think of them as sort of a scale. And on this scale between the cozy, lighthearted, less violent at one end and the super hard-boiled, very dark, very violent at the other end, my books fall about here. Where, where would you say yours fall, Joanne? The marketing line that I have is that my paranormal suspense series is for readers who love paranormal suspense uh, set in, in historical settings with otherworldly experiences that have the pace of a thriller and the feel of an Agatha Christie cozy. So I'm. I'm fast in the thriller part, but I've got that f atmosphere mm -hmm. and feel of a cozy. So the, the thriller part, um, in your, your definition of how it applies to your books, has to do with pace, it, it not, has, not yeah. have to have to do with, you know, yeah, it's mine are, the threats blood of violence. That, the blood that comes in in my books are very tastefully done. Well, blood is very tasty, right? Tastefully. <laughs> Where do yours fall, Kate? You know, they're definitely not cozies, although interestingly, when I started writing them, I sort of, writing the first one, I sort of thought it would be. You know, it has certain things in common with them, like that, that takes place in villages, and they often are set in villages, and um, there's not a lot of blood. I try to avoid a lot of graphic violence, but I just think, they're very noirish, like like Palestine itself has a very noir feel. There's always this blanket of tension hanging over the place, and I think that my books are infused with that to the point where they, it's not a like curling up with your cat kind of a read per se. It's a little more serious than that. I mean. Fortunately, the global genre, I think, is sort of, or subgenre is kind of its own thing. So you can get away with just saying, oh, I write international mysteries. I mean, I used to say I write character-centered mysteries, but then I decided that that's ridiculous because all fiction is character-centered. I mean, what is a story if it doesn't revolve around characters? So I sort of think that that's a cop-out. But it's got a little of the police procedural as well, because I do have a police protagonist. But on the other hand, I really have to say that I did not get a chance to thoroughly research the way that Palestinian police work. I unfortunately do know a fair amount about how Israeli police work. So that part, I think, is pretty fact-based. But like nobody should quote this as evidence of how the Palestinian police work. 
Okay. I know with, with mine, as I said, they're sort of in the middle there, maybe a little bit toward the lighter end. Um, one of the things that I was striving for in mine that I find sometimes is lacking at both ends of the scale um, is the emotional impact that these events, because at both ends of the scale, you're still dealing most of the time with murder, with violence, even if it's off stage, um, with events that are pretty terrible and that are definitely going to have an impact on the people around them. And one of the um, things that I have sometimes not liked about mysteries that I've read is that the emotions don't ring true to me. I mean, at the hard-boiled end, you've got people, I remember reading one where 50 people were blown away in the last scene and the main character who was doing a large part of that blowing away didn't seem to feel anything about it at all other than, oh, good, justice was done. Um, but I would think it would kind of make you feel a little weird. Um, and at the other end, I remember reading a cozy. Um, I read the first couple of chapters. I set it aside because here's a young woman um, in a small town, and she's taking a walk in the park, and she becomes upon the body of a woman she knows. She's not friends with her, but, but she recognizes who it is and is acquainted with it. And, you know, we have that scene of the discovery. We have the scene where the police are called, and the next scene is when she's home having dinner with her husband, and her reaction was, oh boy, we have a murder mystery right here in our little town. And I'm saying, no, that's not right. On a day like that, what you would do is you would go home, you would crawl into bed, and you would pull the covers over your head, and you would just lie there quivering for a long time. And there was no sign that she had any kind of reaction or that this made any impact on her. So that's one of the things that's important to me in writing the, that, my books. Do you bring the emotion in? Oh, yes, you have to especially when I write from the deep point of view because you're in the person's head and you, you know what it is uh, that they're doing. And it's a way to build up the suspense and how you put your words together to uh, show the tension building. Okay. What would you say is the EQ or emotional quotient of your books, Kate? I mean, I definitely think that it's important that people make an emotional connection with the protagonists or with the characters. And, you know, I think I'm more or less successful at that sometimes. And not everybody gets, especially my American, Jewish American protagonist, I don't think people always get what drives her. If they don't know anybody like that, she can come off as, as a little bit um, macabre or something, but I definitely hear you. I mean, I sort of can't stand in, in TV mysteries, especially the kind of, mm -hmm. the scene will wrap up and the last scene is almost always people sort of standing around joking or, you know, sort of having a wedding or something and they don't ever seem to reference the fact that like five people just, that they knew intimately were just killed and I always think that that's very inappropriate. Okay. Yes. A little bit louder, if you can. Uh, no, if, if you say Palestine, and I didn't think there was an actual Palestine, or is there? Um, it's a good question. Um, I mean, to the Palestinians, there sure is. Um, you know, when I first heard people talking about Palestine, I thought that it was kind of an abstraction, but it's not. I mean, that's what their country, to the Palestinians, that's where they live. If you ask a Palestinian kid where they're from, they say, I'm in Palestine, I'm from Palestine. And that's, you know, it's their land. Well, it has ever-changing parameters, mainly shrinking, um, based on Israeli facts on the ground. 
I mean, under the Oslo Accords, which were in, sorry to do a little history digression here, but um, under the Oslo Accords in 1994, there were supposed to be borders drawn. It was supposed to be the West Bank, Gaza, and East Jerusalem. And there were supposed to be borders. There were borders that had been proposed. They were never agreed on. The problem with that is that what is the West Bank and what is East Jerusalem is a matter that to the Israelis is in dispute, um, you know, because they want the Israeli settlements that were constructed there since the, they captured that territory in 1967 to be considered not Palestine, to not be part of, of those borders. And so they're always wanting to draw sort of these weird borders that carve out little isolated enclaves and the Palestinians are not really having that. No, the books are set in Palestine. They, they take place there in that terrain, that contested terrain, the settlements, the existence of settlements. I mean, it's set in the area where I live, which is the area of Palestine, actually. It's called Salfit. It's a small district smack in the middle of the West Bank um, and quite near the Israeli border, the Green Line. And it's the area that has the highest concentration of settlements. Um, mostly because it also has the highest concentration of arable land, of fertile land. Um, so it's always an issue. I mean, the, ex the presence of the settlements and checkpoints and where people can go and where they can't go and the wall that Israel started to construct in 2003, all of that is present in my book. I mean, that's kind of what my books are about. <laughs> yes? Um, I think there's a map. There are maps. Yeah, each book has a map. Um, I had this great map maker um, do did a really good job of um, kind of depicting um, where the story is taking place. Well, I have to offer it. Um, I like to call it a dumb blonde story, but it's, I came to the library, this library, many, quite a number of years ago, and I was thinking of writing some because I had dated a Palestinian, and I wanted to make a character out of him. Mm -hmm. I appreciate we, that question. We're going to move at this point. With, we've been actually talking about this at, at some, to some degree. But it's said that the most common question asked of writers to the point where some writers get annoyed by it, so I'm going to annoy these two by um, asking them this, which is, where do you get your ideas? Kate, you've addressed that to some extent. You saw that event. You're distilling your Palestine experience in your novels. Um, do you have a further thought on that question? or? Well, I mean, just I'm always getting ideas from the newspaper, you know, from things that happen there, and I'll constantly read about stuff. A friend sent me an article, like, well, after I'd written the first draft of Murder Under the Bridge, or the first several drafts, and people were reading it, a friend who had read um, a draft sent me an article from the New York Times about a... Um, squad being formed, police squad being formed in Gaza of only women, that was going to be sort of like a vice squad. And so I got to thinking, oh, I wonder what a, my character, Rania, who's a detective, would think about this. So that made its way into my second book. Now, because I know I can really only probably write one more book set in Palestine, I keep seeing things that seem like they belong in my books and thinking, well, I have to get that in and I have to get that in. So my, my first draft of the third okay. one has way too too many subplots. So, Joanne, you mentioned that rather than deal with all this modern life and contemporary technology, you've set your made your books historical. 
but there has to be more to it than just, oh, I'm going to write a historical novel. Mm -hmm. So wh wh what are the sources of your ideas? I started writing late in life, and so I started doing it my own way. I don't know how others do it, but I actually choose a time period first. My first two romances were medieval only because the last name is Ainsworth, and that's an Anglo-Saxon name. My other two were set in Wyoming in 1895 only because medievals went out of fashion and I had spent four months in Buffalo, Wyoming, so I set my stories there. And these latest two, which are World War II, with the US government recruiting psychics to find Nazi spies, I wrote them in World War II because I was a child in World War II. I remember that experience. Also, I set them in Philadelphia, and I lived in the 1950s in Philadelphia. And I brought in paranormal suspense because in one of my romance novels, my character was blinded. She was, had her sight till eight, and then a disease blinded her. And there were some parts where we couldn't get her, where she could logically get herself around a castle. And I brought in a ghostly grandmother that when she touched a charm, the grandmother would point the way for her to go. Um, I, and I found I like that. And also, in 1974 to 78, I attended the Berkeley Psychic Institute for Psychic Healing, and it's still in Berkeley and has its website. I brought some of those ideas in. I couldn't bring much in, Besides, it's pretty much in the past, so I don't remember as much. But when you write a novel, you have to write according to the needs of the novel. And my critique, I have two critique partners who, who are very clever. And we have to bring in the psychic and the suspense to keep the novel going. But I, can, it, I don't have to worry about real life because I'm setting up my own story world. And they'll say, well, this is a little flat, Joanne. Can you bring in some aromas so it's the villain, so I bring in something that's rotted? Or they'll say, how about some color here? And I'll put some bright colors into the, the thought waves that my clairvoyant wave over here, a US wave, is sending out. I, I build my stories first from my setting, my time period, and then I say, what is my story question in that time period? My story question for this is, can psychics find Nazi spies? Then I say, what kind of characters do I need in order to find these? And since I come out of writing romance, I of course have a heroine and a hero as my protagonists and always a villain. And once I get to that point, then I start my research and I plot and I have an Excel chart that I, I put in all my scenes, the, reason, the description of it, the point of view character, the timeline, the, how they're going to change, all those kinds of things. That takes me about a month or two. And then I start to write. So how, what about how you, you Peggy? <laughs> well, we'll take the question first, and then I'll get to how I do ah, it. Yes. It's only the psychic abilities. The US government recruited the clairvoyant to lead this team. Her other uh, team partners, one is a medium, one is a crystal ball reader, one is a nurse with healing hands, and one is a man who sees ghosts. Each of them have their reason for being because I did anticipate making this a series. Consequently, I am going to move 
my characters around as I write more books. This third book that I'm writing now for this series will complete this series, and I will use another one of the team uh, in, in my other novels. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. You've seen them. They're part of like a Star Wars kind of effect. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, so I, I just wanted to say that, that uh, I think the world that you create is very believable, even though describing mm -hmm. it to others outside the book seems to <laughs> Thank you. That everybody. Um, the I other part of it is that I'm glad that you told me, because I've heard you talk before uh, about your books. And uh, this is the first time I've heard you say, Well, <laughs> thank you. I, that's why I believe it, it won in the category of mystery suspense, because I was able to build up that suspense. And for me, it's that big chart that I make before I ever start writing. It keeps track of everything and helps me to build the suspense. Paranormal, I think, as it's used as a label for books, because this one is a paranormal also, or is, is referred to that way. Um, refers to almost any kind of element of sort of otherworldliness. There's a lot of, um, this is a ghost story. It doesn't have, um, my main character has abilities that I would call psychic, but there's many kinds of psychic. Um, if you have vampires and, and werewolves in your story, it'll probably be lumped as paranormal. This does not have any of that. Um, I think when people ask me, well, why are you writing that, and, and um, do you believe in the ghosts that you write in? Do you believe in ghosts? And my answer is no, I don't believe that they operate in the world, and if they do, it's not the way I describe. But I do believe that the boundaries of reality are a bit larger than we give them credit for. And it's those boundaries that I'm trying to push a little and consider what some of the possibilities might be. So they're very close to the real world, um, but there is this element that um, is outside of our usual experience that um, can be a little hard to explain and bothers my main character that she has these. Yes, sir. I let her walk into the room and have the experience and go, what the heck just happened? And then she has to and deal with that, especially when she realizes it's only happening to her, or at least it's only happening, she's the only one who perceives it. And uh, so this grew out of a conversation that I had with an editor and another writer as we were doing this great game that writers play called What If? Oh, here's a thought. What if this happens? Well, what if that happens? What if we did this over here instead? Um, it's set in, in Marin County because I know Marin County and find it a very interesting place. Um, 
This one began, I had done some writing about this, the, my artist detective before in an, in, my, in an earlier book and in a couple of short stories, and there was a recurring um, policeman, uh, police officer, police detective uh, character. And I was sitting, speaking of where you're getting your ideas, they sometimes just pop in. I was sitting on a, my deck on a day that was as beautiful as today. I was reading a book that was totally else, not related to what this became at all. And all of a sudden, as I'm reaching for my tea mug to take a sip, the little voice in my head says, in the next novel, Gardino's daughter goes missing. And I'm going, oh, he has a daughter? And it sort of evolved from there. You sort of think, okay, we have this missing child. What are the circumstances? What could have happened? Why would somebody have taken her? Or was she taken at all? Has she just wandered off and gotten lost in the woods? Um, you start asking, you come up with that first idea, you start asking questions, and I think that often it's the second idea that occurs to you. The, the thing that comes together to go, snap, oh, this is where it could go, that really is what begins the creative process. And, and you're a plotter too, are you not? Well, that's, she's, she just asked me, and she says, and you're a plotter too, are you not? Yes, and there's this, terminology that floats around. I, uh, I first ran into it in the mystery community. I've heard other fiction writers use it as well, and it's the plotters versus pantsers debate. Are any of you familiar with these terms? Well, plotter is a fairly um, obvious term. That's plotter, P-L-O-T-T, -T, not P-L-O-D-D. -D. ERS. Although many of us are that. Uh, although, although many of us are that. The, the pantsers are the ones who just sit down and r start writing. You write by the seat of your pants. You don't know what's going to happen next. The theory is, well, if, I, you know, if I'm surprised, the reader will be surprised. If I plan out the story in advance, then why bother to write the story at all if I already know what, knows what happens? Um, and so those are kind of the two extremes. Um, I personally think that there are only plotters. It's just that the pantsers don't call their plot outline a plot outline. They call it the first draft. Um, we've heard about Joanne's Excel spreadsheets and her, her detailed plotting. How about you? You know, I recently did Last November, I did something called National Novel Writing Month. I don't know if people know it, NaNoWriMo. It's my favorite tool for mm -hmm. writing a first draft. And basically, you, you try to write 50,000 words in 30 days. And the point of that, or the, the way you manage that, is that you just write it. And you don't stop to think about whether it's any good, which it never is. And but you also don't use fine. contractions, and you give all your characters double first names. Many you know, names. Peggy Sue and Bobby Joe. and <laughs> Many names. And Palestinian names are really good for that, because everybody has like four names. Plus, there's the name that they're actually called, which is two names, usually Abu something, so or Um something. So um, yeah, you can add a lot of words that way um, but but during that time I was reading some stuff that they sent out and I learned to call myself a plantser which is <laughs> somewhere in between a planner and a pantser I mean I sort of I started out thinking okay the first few days I'm just gonna do a quick outline or really what I thought was gonna be a treatment like kind of a quick first um, present tense summary and then I was gonna go back and fill it in and but then it didn't happen that way I just sort of I got some scenes and I started writing them and so then I ended up just sort of staying with that and writing this bad first draft but I mean I definitely have to I have to have the story so 
because I'm terrified that I'll get halfway through and not be able to figure out where it's going and lose it and just stop. So I try to tear through something. And, you know, I have quoted that line of Peggy's many times that um, we all outline. It's just some of us call it our first draft. I would say for sure I'm that. And I do, I do a kind of an in-between process, too. When I was writing my first novel, I wrote, I outlined about a third of it, but then I got impatient to start writing. And so I wrote as much as I had, or almost to that point, and then I realized I had no clue what hap was gonna happen next. So I outlined the next third. And as I got to, and then wrote that, and then as I got to the point where I had left off on the outline, I'm going, I have no idea where this is going. Um, I know what the, how, what the very end is going to be, but I don't know how to get there, so I did that third section of outline. And I've done, that's how this book was done as well. This one I had sold in advance, and the editor wanted a synopsis, and the only way I could figure out, before I started writing it, and the only way I could figure out how to give a synopsis for a book I had not started writing yet was to come up with an outline for the whole thing because otherwise I would have no idea what to put in the synopsis. So I did and then I boiled it down. And this book was was very, very easy to write. I have a sequel to this that will probably be out by the end of the year, this year called House of Desire, which takes place in San Francisco and the haunted house in question there is based somewhat loosely on the Haas Lilienthal house here in San Francisco. If any of you are familiar with that wonderful old Victorian mansion. I worked there for about three years and learned a lot of its nooks and crannies. It's, a, it's on Franklin Street. It's um, yeah. between Washington and Jackson right in there. Hmm? It's one in from a corner. It's, and what did you do there? I was the communications director for the what was called at the time the, the Foundation for San Francisco's Architectural Heritage which is a historic preservation organization, which is still exists and still based there. Um, and our offices were in the upstairs of the house above the part that was open for, for tours. Yes? I heard somebody telling me about that, and I haven't had a chance to go by. See, it's like ghosts. It's on Franklin. Um, it's just past Jackson, I think. Um, Sounds like Pacific. And so Pacific may be the next one. I, I sort well, of forget. It, it's where it levels off. It's at the top of the hill. It goes up a hill. Franklin does. It levels off. There's the Haas Lilienthal House, and then it goes, plunges, to, the street plunges down to the marina. Well, you can see so. we writers all have our different styles of writing and our different ways that we get at things. One thing, though, is that we're all older writers, and we write empowered characters. Our female uh, heroine is empowered. And mm -hmm. I would like to know, Kate, how, how you get who you're empowered. Oh, yes. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, I think the the feminist novel, the feminist mystery as a genre, a subgenre, and also the lesbian mystery, you know, it's kind of interesting because after, when I thought I had a pretty solid draft of this first one, Murder Under the Bridge, and I wanted to start shopping it, and I wanted to see how it played on the lesbian street. So I put out a call to people I knew for, um, what did I call them, random lesbian readers or something. And I had some criteria, you know, like they had to be political but not know too much about the Middle East and some other things. And um, I got some. I got a few. It was a really good experience. And um, actually, 
a couple of them came from Blue and Julie. <laughs> um, and that was really helpful. And one of those readers asked me, do you think of this as a lesbian novel, a lesbian mystery or a mystery with a lesbian protagonist? And I was like, oh, well, what's the difference? And she said, well, if it's a lesbian mystery, then I would expect there to be more about the relationship. And I hadn't really thought about that. And I definitely think that, like, I did know that you had to have sex. That if you want lesbians to read your mystery, you got to have lesbian sex. So I made sure that there's sex in this first one. Um, but I didn't maybe set up that particular element as artfully as I might have. And some people are kind of shocked by it. I mean, people are shocked good, shocked bad. But I definitely, in this one, you know, I really tried to weave the relationships in more. But there's also the fact that it occurred to me that in this one, the lesbians kind of have a lot of sex and the straight protagonist doesn't. Like, she's very not sexualized. And it's also, you know, because she's Palestinian, I think that I was a little reluctant to get quite that into the business of Palestinians and maybe it felt not so respectful and she's Muslim but then I felt like I don't like it when it on, when the lesbians are asexual and everybody's having sex around them and they're not having sex so I thought so in this one I like challenged myself to write I won't call them sex scenes they're really not but love scenes between the straight people the straight Palestinian couple and um, so then I think, well, but does that make it less of a lesbian novel? And it's also interesting because when I went to apply for Lambda, for the Lambda Literary Awards, they have, you can, you choose your category and the categories are lesbian mystery or gay mystery. And there's not LGBT mystery. And I was like, I started to check lesbian mystery and then I thought, well, wait a minute, like, because the murder is more gay, like the the central storyline in a certain way is more around gay men, but then there's this lesbian couple, but the sex, there's gay sex and lesbian sex, but I ended up deciding it's a lesbian mystery because one, I'm a lesbian, and two, like the relationship is lesbian. So, but we'll see, like my theory about why I didn't win last time, because it couldn't be because the book wasn't good enough, was that <laughs> maybe it wasn't lesbian enough. So we'll see if this one's lesbian enough, because again, no is, way is it not good enough. Which is, part, which is part of the problem, I think, with trying to label books as this kind of book or that kind of book. Um, you know, the only real useful label, I think, is, is it a good one or is it not a good one? Um, I once went to a fiction bookstore in Boston, which I really enjoyed. I don't know whether it's still there or not. It was all fiction, but it shelved all the books alphabetically by author. That was the only distinction they made. And the science fiction and the romance and the literary novels and the mysteries were all right next to each other. And the bookseller said, well, I figure, you know, this way people are more likely to discover something that they might not ordinarily read and, and, and discover that they fall in love with it. About empowered heroines, I think it's hard for anyone to go through the process of trying to solve a mystery, fight a crime, overcome the kind of, of situation that we find in our this kind of fiction um, without feeling, having a certain level of independence, confidence. Um, in the case of Claire, the heroine in this one, that's part of what she is discovering about herself through her coming to terms with this psychic ability that she has. Um, it's part of what I think Jess, the heroine of this one, already suspects about herself. It also gives us as, as authors a chance to expand our own power a bit. I was at a, um, a panel one time where the authors on the panel were asked, how do your heroines resemble yourselves and where do they differ? And everybody basically said, well, our heroines are thinner, younger, and braver than we are. 
And, uh, and I think in my case, certainly the braver part um, makes a difference because I couldn't imagine myself actually going out and doing some of these things that my heroines do. But I like the fact that they're out in the world doing them. Joanne, what's your thought? And, and my characters are set in World War II. The 40s were very restrictive on women. However, the war broke down a lot of that restriction. Consequently, my very shy wallflower heroine, who is a part, well, she's like the, she's with a wealthy family, but she's the one that's, that uh, has no money. She comes into being a wave out of duty. By going through that training, she gets more uh, experience and strength. Then she becomes head of this team that the government appoints her to, and she gains more. But it has to be gradual. You can't just plop it in there. You have to work it out. And that's why my Excel, Excel, Excel chart works so well for me, my spreadsheet, because I can decide when I'm going to make her take the next step where she gets confidence in what she does. Um, go ahead. We're going to open it for questions now. So. They're actually both real pictures. They're free pictures that come from World War II government photos. And the covers were done by the publishers. I only had a little bit of input uh, into that. Yeah. And it looks like it's the same woman, but it's not. It's, it's different. They put big glasses because my heroine has, has glasses, and that changed the photo. Yes. Uh, yeah, I, I, I don't have header titles or role titles. What I do is I start out with my scene one. Oh, oh I, I already had told you that I plot everything out before I start writing, so I always know how things are going to end. It, st it starts when the shoe drops, and I know where it's going to end. So I've already figured out my major crisis points along the way. I, is is all that I do what you is, use the Excel for? Is or, or in order to keep my timeline? Did you figure that line. out and then put them in the Excel? Oh, I fig. Uh, oh no, the Excel chart helps me pull it together as I go along. So my columns are first the chapter and the scene, but then I describe what's going to happen in that particular scene. I usually have about three scenes for each of my uh, chapters, and I choose what my location will be, what my point of view character will be. I choose then how I have another column that says how the change is going to come about, and another column that lets me know the emotional impact, because I'm writing from deep point of view, so they will go from insecurity to feeling confident. Well, that's how I, I break it down. I, I do that every, every line is a scene. And I am able to move things around as I need to. I, I don't always follow what I put in that chart, but it really helps me a lot. Like Peggy said, when she did her synopsis, the writing went a lot faster. It helps me out that way. And I use Excel also, and I, I have the same kind of approach as Joanne, but I also have, like, so I'll have the point of view character, but also the minor characters, so I can sort of keep track of, you know, how often somebody's showing up, and if somebody's in chapter three and then doesn't come back until chapter 22, I know that that could be a problem, or at least if I want to keep it that way, I need to make sure to remind people who that is, or you know, see if I can intersperse that person somewhere else. 
every scene. And I also do something, um, I rate every scene on the tension, on a tension level from one to five. And then at the end, eventually I'll like make a graph that sort of will show me how the tension is so I can see if I have parts that are going too much like this or, you know, like if it, like you kind of want it to go like this. And if you have parts that are too flat or, um, or to, you know, even if the tension's really high for too long and you don't have a dip, that's, I think, not good either. These people are so organized. <laughs> well, that I comes hate. after quite a while of muddling around. Though. I just like Excel intensely, and we're going to wrap up here in just a moment. But uh, I, I just, I, I, will, I will write a paragraph describing what happens in, in a scene up as far as I get around, you know, to the point where I get tired of outlining and want to start writing. But when, just to answer the, do you do it by scene or by chapter, um, I think it's much easier if you're going to write a novel to think in terms of scenes. The scenes may turn out to be chapters, or a chapter, as Joanne said, may have several scenes, and they can sort themselves into chapters later, but it's much easier to think of what is happening now, what action is taking place in this time, in this moment, in this point of view, um, rather than to think of them as chapters. Um, Yes, and there's thank you also very much. chocolate in the back. And there's chocolate in the back. Okay. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you very much. Thank you, Joan. Great questions, everybody.